afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us both here in the room and on Zoom. We appreciate having an audience and an opportunity to get to hear more from Dr. James Taylor. Uh, just by way of announcements, um, we have eight questions that we'll run through, very similar to what you did this morning, but different questions. Our questions were solicited from our NIC campus community and then grouped and themed, and that's how we arrived at the eight that we have. So that gives you an idea of how much time you have for each question. Um, and we'll give you some time for some opening remarks and closing remarks as well. And then a reminder to our audience that there's an online feedback form that you can complete. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. James Taylor. But first, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Dr. Sherry Simpkins. I'm the Dean of Instruction for General Studies. So Dr. James Taylor is a Senior Associate Vice President for Utah State University and the Chief Campus Administrator for multiple campuses and educational centers in Eastern Utah. He is also an Associate Professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. His academic and professional passions include sustainable rural and mountain communities, relationships that bind people and plates, and effective, authentic leadership. He has a bachelor's degree in biogeography from the University of Utah, a master's in earth science from Montana State University, and a doctorate in leadership and organizational development from Grand Canyon University. Prior to Utah State, he was Dean and Vice President for Colorado Mountain College in the Rocky Mountains. And he was also Campus President for a successful healthcare college with two campuses and a national online presence. So with that, Dr. Taylor, if there's any opening remarks you'd like to make, please go ahead. I will, and I'll just say that, uh, and I assume there we go. This is the first time that I've come to a public venue, whether that's professional, public, and no one has referenced James Taylor, uh, the singer. And so either one, that means the age of the group is different than everywhere else I hang out, or two, you're very sensitive and respectful. I will say he's my favorite all-time performer. So, and I saw him in October in Salt Lake City, and uh, I just never have I been a place that no one's made a reference to James Taylor. So uh, I see that as a, either a positive or you're, you're out of touch. So... <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't really have an opening statement, uh, other than it's good to see many of you again. Uh, some of you were here this morning, and it's nice to see all of you again. All right, we'll dive into our questions then. Why are you interested in being the president of North Idaho College? What is your understanding of the challenges and opportunities facing the college? So I just had lunch with the uh, president's executive team or cabinet. And, and this question has come up in the first round of interviews with uh, uh, the, however many candidates they interviewed the first time. The answer is, is evolving, it's changing. And, and because of that, I'm gonna go back to uh, this morning's open forum. I had mentioned that I didn't apply early in the process. I actually applied very late in the process, not because I am a procrastinator. In fact, I'm quite the opposite generally. Uh, and the, the thing I'm gonna reveal this time is that uh, the why may be less uh, calculated. I do tend to lead uh, based on information, data, kind of informative information, things that gather me. I also tend to make decisions from the heart and what feels correct, the universe kind of coming together. And, and I would say that my the, the catalyst that got me to finally apply was probably less specific and more of a feeling that this was an amazing place What's come since then is the discovery of information that validated that same idea. And, and really today's conversations with uh, people have given me that same sense. Uh, years and years ago, and my wife and I, and I talked about this last night, um, I interviewed for a different university at a different, in a different state. And I was on campus for about 40 minutes. She wasn't with me. She didn't travel with me at that time. And I, I remember going into a, probably a bathroom, but a, a private place and texting her and saying, this is not the place. I'll, I'll guarantee you that hasn't happened yet. Uh, so um, it, it's the more I've learned about North Idaho, that gut feeling that this was a place with a purpose uh, that could be really something special and is something special today has just, uh, that's grown as I've investigated. And, and I also have to say my interest uh, 
there, there could be a misunderstanding. This is an opportunity for me to clarify. I really care about where I live. So the location, not the job, does matter. But I didn't pick North Idaho because of the location. I would not have picked North Idaho had it not been in a beautiful, I, I've lived in Jackson, Wyoming, Bozeman, Montana, Leadville, Colorado, uh, beautiful mountain, rural, uh, Chamonix, France, uh, places. But that's not why I applied, but it doesn't certainly hurt. Uh, but it's the college that, that is the reason I applied. The, the history, the, the place, and the unique historical value of this college versus others that are evolving quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and the second part of that is your understanding of the challenges and opportunities. Thanks. You know, again, the challenges sometimes it, it's, uh, I'll use a family analogy. Sometimes the, you know, someone might walk by a home and, and hear people yelling or screaming in, in the home or, or even a car. And you think, okay, what's the challenge? The challenge is they're fighting. Sometimes that's too easy of an assumption. I, I don't think the challenges are sometimes what people might attribute the challenges to at North Idaho College, which means maybe stuff that's going on. The challenges are being prepared for the future, being prepared for what students want. The, the little things that might go on temporarily in, in a kind of uh, outward setting or what's seen from the outside, those are just distractions. I would say in the family situation, you've got to find out what's really creating the, the unhappiness or what's creating the lack of synergy. I, I, I'm not, I, most of my athletics, and I'm speaking to the athletic, uh, the basketball coach in the back here, but most of my athletics are individual sports. Climbing is not an individual sport. That's an expedition sport. I got kicked off the high school team before I even got my sweatpants off. Uh, so I can't speak some basketball analogy. However, what I can say is when the team's not getting along, it may not just be that there's uh, something amiss with one player or one person, it may be just lack of vision pulling together. It takes someone in that coaching uh, leadership direction to give uh, a vision. Um, I don't think there's a lack of vision for North Idaho College. So I don't think this is a place that lacks executive uh, thinkers, people capable, uh, energy commitment. But I do think it's nice to have an opportunity for someone to come bring that all together. And so the challenges, I think, if we try to go back and maybe dissect and remove the past, that actually may be counterproductive. We need to prepare for the future as a group and as a team and have someone who can moderate and help build that team, trust with each other and provide a vision. But that vision's not going to be mine. It's going to be ours. It's going to be something we develop. All right. If you came to an impasse with the board of trustees on an issue you felt extremely passionate about, how would you proceed? So I'm gonna give a, an actual example um, because I think if I talk in generalities, it may, it may leave things unsaid. Uh, years ago, I ran a, a healthcare college and we had a lot of different programs. So an RN program, registered nurse, uh, uh, a BSN, bachelor's of science in nursing. We also had some allied health programs. One of them was a medical billing and coding. And, and as a for-profit proprietary school, no state money came our way, no donors, very few donors gave us money. It was all tuition. And so it was a very clean business model in terms of what tuition came in is what we could spend on staff, faculty, and that's how we could expand programs. Uh, this medical billing and coding program was national. It was all over the country. And, and we recruited students into this program and it would cost, oh, let's say $12,000 or $15,000 to get through this certificate, part of the promise was that students, when they graduate, could work from their home. The truth is that wasn't true, meaning most often medical billers at the time would have to go work in a clinical setting in a hospital. Eventually, if they were good and had a reputation, their employer might let them go home and work. You know, now today, post-pandemic, everyone works remotely, but, but back then it was not true. And so our students were defaulting on their student loans. And, and then there was another problem. I had a call one day, I, I was, uh, my, the Dean of Academic Affairs was in my office. Uh, he got a call, so we called back the student. And he said, I went through the enrollment process, paid you know, the first month's or tuition for the first course, and I didn't get the folder. We said, what folder did you not get? And this person said, with all the answers for the exams. And I said, where, where does that folder come from? And he said, my niece, 
my brother and my aunt all got this folder that came with all the answers. So there was a national cheating situation and they, they were using this program as what's called a Pell Runner program. So students would sign up with no intention to work. They, they would just use it to maximize student loans uh, and use the difference between tuition and Pell to, as an income source. What that did to the college, this is a long answer, but I'm almost done, was threaten our title, our funding, our student funding, because our cohort default rate was rising rapidly. Meaning when we hit 23, 24% of our past graduates not paying federal loans, we would lose access to federal funding. So back to the board, I went and met with the board. I met with the board every month. And I said, we have to shut down this program. It's hurting my nursing program, which is what our bread and butter is. Uh, that's what brought in the money. But from a, I would say, cursory glance, shutting down a $9 million revenue program seemed like a challenge. Um, and the board, they're, they're good men and women that were on this board, but I, I, I did say my reputation as a president is on the line and my belief in what we should do academically. I don't wanna have a program that's not giving people what they expect out of the program or allowing people to take advantage of the system. Uh, and so not only my recommendation, but we need to shut this program down. We came to a, a, a moderate uh, compromise. They asked me to develop another program that offset the revenue. So I, I, I did, we built an online BSN, Bachelors of Science and Nursing completion program that did offset, but also matched our core competencies in nursing and was reputable. And so uh, it's challenging, uh, you know, but there's ways to work and negotiate with. That's an easier example than perhaps what your question really implies. You know, luckily I'm at a stage of my career too, where if something were fundamentally wrong, and I don't mean this about North Idaho, but if I was working for my current employer, Utah State, and they asked me to do something that was immoral, unethical, uh, I wouldn't do it. I would uh, make sure there's a clear line that uh, it's just not worth my reputation and my kind of self-worth to do something. But I, I don't believe most people would ask at that level. I think it's mostly misunderstanding about either in the case I gave uh, income, budgets, but, but we'd certainly first try to talk it out, so. Thank you. <clears throat> Please discuss your experience with navigating the pandemic in a higher education setting and describe how that experience would inform how you might approach higher education in the future. <clears throat> so there was, for me, there was no roadmap for navigating the pandemic. And I still remember um, I was on a treadmill in our gym in the building where I have my office. Um, I have a gym upstairs for students, staff and faculty. And I was watching the news, which for some that may seem like an odd thing to do while you're running, but um, I was watching the news and they were, it was in March. And I remember them announcing closures in some locations. And I remember thinking, oh, I, I can't do that. Not, not just work-wise, but personally, I, I just, I can't survive that. And I thought, I bet I could do it for a week. You know, I, I could, if, if they shut us down for a week, I could handle that. And by the way, I'm generally an introvert. Professionally, I, I, I don't mind being extroverted, but I grew up very much, I like being alone. I just don't like being told to be alone. Uh, and so that's a little bit of a kind of a rebelliousness. And I, I remember getting the call as the state and higher education in my state and those stakeholders, we got together to decide what to do. The decisions being made were being made on the Wasatch Front where most of the stakeholders and political leaders lived and governed. I actually happen to run campuses in very dispersed counties across Eastern Utah, uh, density of which is really kind of low. And, and where the Wasatch Front was hitting huge record numbers uh, of cases and positivity, we had almost no cases. Most of my agricultural workers, farmers working outside, oil field workers, uh, don't travel to the Wasatch Front. And so the decisions being made, although they apply, they just didn't apply yet to where I was. So it was hard to navigate. And my challenge, and, and we were successful, was let's work together, but let's make sure the decisions being made apply to where we are, not just to where you are as a decision maker. So my job was to advocate, communicate, and explain when that should be. And so we created targets. 
when we hit this rate, when we hit this, uh, this threshold, we'll follow that rule. And the state was fairly good with us. The challenge I have, my campuses expand, uh, they're over a, a wide region. Um, as the pandemic evolved, um, it was like uh, that game whack-a-mole, you know, where things popped up and where things were, you know, hot for one moment changed. Utah State University already let out in terms of technology and distance education. So we had the technology to meet the academics. The bigger challenge also became, I, I have campuses in very distinctly uh, unique communities that were very um, conservative uh, against mandates and things like that. So my job as a, uh, as a leader of a higher education institution was to work and, and communicate with uh, those elected officials and people in those regions. So it was a challenge. I was very proud though of my team at each campus, how they worked together to offset the kind of challenges. The irony is as the Wasatch Front numbers dropped and things were lessened, that's when I was hitting the peak. Uh, and so it's funny how uh, it was out of touch with like our reality, but it, but it still was one of those things. I actually still see many positives that came out of the pandemic in terms of forcing people to evaluate what was positive about their lives and what maybe they could drop. Um, things that maybe didn't matter as much. Even in my own life with my family, uh, what was a week that I could survive? Uh, we have two young children at home and then two grown adults. Uh, I realized I don't ever want to be a K through 12 teacher again because uh, teaching our children certainly was challenging. Uh -huh. So thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. NIC has multiple locations in the region. How would you ensure faculty and staff feel like one big team despite being miles apart? And, and not just miles apart, but uh, functionally apart and different purposes. And one of the things that I bring is, like I said, with where I am now at Utah State with campuses that are dispersed. But Colorado Mountain College, I had campuses in different counties. Uh, dispersed campuses are always a challenge. Someone generally feels like we're not part of the, the mothership or we're um, stepchildren from a, a, a merged marriage or some sort of analogy that you want to apply. Um, that actually is one of the areas where I've been quite successful in finding ways to not elevate the group that feels slighted, but creating exposure and understanding for the group that doesn't think. You're close to Canada, so I'll give an example. Years ago, I used to climb in Canada quite a bit. And years ago, I had a friend, we were in British Columbia climbing. And one of the Canadians said, oh, you guys are Americans. You don't, you think of us Canadians as second class citizens. And, and my friend as quick as could be said, we don't think of you at all. And, and, and the point was sometimes, and I'm not saying that's how I feel by the way, Oh, Canada. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking that sometimes how small campuses that are not part of the mothership, it may not be directly that someone's saying you're treating me poorly. It may literally be you're not thinking of me at all. And one of the ways that you change that perception, and it's so simple, and I like to travel, is are there executive leaders on those campuses or do they only show up when a donor's at that campus? Do they only show up? So when I ran the Leadville campus, 30 miles south was Buena Vista, which had a small technical campus. And we had a big donor who donated the money, uh, $15 million at the time to build this campus. And then it was underutilized. And the donor was upset because we, I mean, there was a big donation, a bank was involved, the community was involved. Uh, we hired a center director and a few faculty down there, but just didn't maximize. And, and part of my plan was to spend days a week down there, be available. And even though you might argue my time was better spent at the main campus where people had access to me, by being present, there's two things that happened. One, I saw the journey. What were the real challenges? Two, the community started coming in and talking to me. It's almost like open office hours for a faculty member. And, and then three, I go get lunch at a restaurant. I end up running, rubbing shoulders with the mayor or a, a county commissioner. Those are the kinds of things. But what I found was other faculty and staff started doing the same. And I had an EMS instructor, uh, emergency med medical services, and my uh, search and rescue um, instructor. He lived in that region, but would travel up to the main campus. He eventually came to me and said, can I teach from this campus? It would save me a commute. And the more he did that, the more I showed up, others started to populate the campus. So I think there's things we can do 
to be more present, uh, have more of a, a, a listening ear that's not formal, like, hey, we're going to come out and have a listening session, but informal. Uh, I do think that for a president, uh, this is a good example on this campus. If you drive and walk into your office, at the end of the day, you get in your car and drive home, you cannot be an effective community college president. If you come to a multi-campus system and only visit the other campus at formal events, you also will fall short in terms of understanding. The third is something that uh, I think you have to bring to the job. You have to appreciate what happens at the Parker Center, at the Workforce Training Center, which are those programs have to be valued to begin with. So I, I do think that um, merging and bringing together three campuses or three sites or three places is kind of my bread and butter. But I don't know that my solutions will apply. Part of that's the journey of figuring out what it will require here. Mm -hmm. How would you tackle the issue of staffing and faculty shortages in today's labor market? I think for North Idaho College, the, we just talked at lunch, the bigger challenge might not be the staff shortage, but the housing availability. I, I worry for North Idaho um, when you pay educators to come to a region like this. Uh, the analogous situation will be Aspen. At, uh, we had at Colorado Mountain College, we had a campus in Aspen. It's hard. You either have to hire someone who lives there already um, or provide housing for staff. And, and both of those are pretty common. Park City uh, School District in Utah is very similar to here in terms of how do you hire a high school English teacher for 40,000 in a place where the minimum home is a million dollars. Uh, one of the ways is to develop uh, housing, staff housing. I don't know that that's the solution because one of the problems with that is that it's temporary. You're not embedding them in the community and they're not building equity. There's challenges. So staff turnover is one issue. I think a bigger, not bigger, but a equally big issue here is going to be how do we make sure that staff can have a viable livelihood here uh, while they're actually in this region trying to start a career or stay in a career. The, the, the other part about turnover is that I do think one of the roles of a president and an executive team um, is to spend time understanding each individual person. And that's something I can't go meet with a thousand employees, but I can meet with a thousand employee supervisors and ask the right questions of those supervisors. And eventually you start to find out, it's like a family. And luckily I don't have a thousand kids, I have four. Um, but each one of those kids at different times needs something and knowing when to ask the right questions um, is important. So staff turnover, I, I think for North Idaho is going to be a multifaceted problem, it deals with housing. I do think you have embedded in the people I've met already a desire to be here. I don't think people are leaving because they don't believe in North Idaho. They're leaving because um, North Idaho College I think they're leaving because of uncertainty and unstableness. And so stabilizing will be a big part, stabilizing a presidency, stabilizing the executive team, getting all the vice presidency roles filled. By the way, even though I don't think this is a big challenge that can't easily be overcome, if I work in an institution and accreditation shows up as a potential loss, as a staff member, that would be a worry. If I work at a bank and I don't know if we're gonna be FDIC insured, <laughs> I would worry. So, so we have to look at the big things that come up. I don't think those are challenges that can't be overcome. Once we get through that, I, I do think there's issues to still be dealt with. And some of it is having a unified vision for the future. One of the things that people leave, one of the reasons people leave is that the vision may not be something they contributed to and they wanna be part of that. And then the last part is I do think there's some unknowns in our workforce and I don't care if it's in the auto industry, uh, electrical work or higher education, people's expectations from work, it, it's changing dramatically. And, and that's something we've got to discover. Um, even if at Utah State, we're developing and have it rolled out a remote work policy. There are some jobs that can't be remote. There are some jobs that we are finding out we can do. And that's part of balancing family life. When I was little, and it's, I'm older than at least two thirds of the room, um, when my mom and dad, my dad's an MD and my mom's a school teacher, when they came home, they were generally home. Today, when people come home, they're distracted and they're not home. They're still getting work calls. They're still getting work emails. And, and, and you know, as a president, uh, I, I live this 
journey here and I would live it, I live it currently, I, I can't get away from my phone, but we can find time to help families. Part of being a good employer is helping them be good family people, or if they're not family people, maybe they have a dog, but allowing them time to be healthy. Uh, if it's recreationally, allowing them time. We get a better employee if our help, if our, we get a better work if our employees are healthy and happy. Absolutely. <clears throat> Please describe your experience with supporting diversity related programs within your institution. Uh, when I got to Utah State University, we're the land grant institution and we serve regions, I serve regions that are populated by the Northern Ute tribe. Well, actually 38 indigenous people, uh, tribes, groups, uh, but the Navajo Nation is the largest. Uh, the Northern Utes have about 2,800 members that are registered uh, within my campus region but I only had 4% of my enrollment uh, at my campuses from the Northern Ute Tribe. And, and so we had to make a commitment to how do we get more students from the Northern Ute Tribe. And, and the Navajo Nation, they, at our Blanding campus, they occupy about 65 to 68% of the enrollment. But, but it was a challenge. But what I found was, and this is acknowledging a mistake, I was targeting the Northern Ute Tribe, but not realizing there are many, many other tribes that also uh, by targeting one, I was creating, I thought I was making EDI efforts in terms of inclusion, and I was excluding at the same time. And so EDI efforts are very, not delicate, but they have to be done sensitively. I had an administrative assistant, her name's Latricia, and uh, she had started in my student services team as a front desk person, uh, and she was doing a, a bachelor's degree, and she graduated. Then she started in a master's program in my, my department. And I made her my administrative assistant because she was very good at some things, but her number one quality is, is equity, diversity, and inclusion. And she ran with that part of her job to the point where a year and a half ago, I eliminated my position, uh, not my position, but my administrative assistant position, which I don't have one today, uh, and empowered her as our director of equity, diversity, and inclusion so that she could be solely focused on efforts to make the campus uh, help the campus. So she's done three or four things. One is training. We have a monthly training. Uh, the training is even diversified. That sounds like a, a little bit of an irony, but we don't do all of our training on diversity. We diversify our training on lots of topics. Um, the other part about equity, diversity, and inclusion, just like my Ute Tribe example, by the way, we got up to 21% of Ute Tribe membership at my campus right before the pandemic, and then it dropped uh, because of uh, the pandemic. We're back up to about 12% now. Uh, but diversity, equity, and inclusion has to be done um, that's not targeting the group. So I, I live and work in very conservative communities in Utah. I also have to be a safe place for those students who want to also feel like where they're going to school allows them to be uh, who they want to be. So it's, it's not swinging the needle one way. It's opening up a center and a place where students feel valued and welcome. Um, I said this to the group who interviewed me the first round. One of the things about diversity, equity, and inclusion that I value is long before it was not a catchphrase, but a kind of a, an initiative in higher education and workforce in the United States. I saw international, through international travel, not to Paris, but to Lima, Peru, to Juarez, Peru to small mountain villages, people and groups that were not included in the global landscape and global conversation. That's where my kind of uh, eyes on equity, diversity and inclusion came from. Not in a politically motivated or a um, kind of charged atmosphere, but more of seeing people who lived on $100 a year in La Paz, Bolivia, where I spent $100 a day traveling in that, that country. That's what shapes my equity, diversity, and inclusion. I also have things in my family kind of dynamics that have helped me understand other people's journeys. In terms of uh, just being able to be uh, empathetic and understand, but as a college campus, I would say we are still, we always lag a little on initiatives. So you might think that, not you, but someone might think uh, EDI means targeting a certain population. The, t the population you target today may be important, but there's a population we're not supporting today. So if you wanna be really effective on EDI, you can't target. By the way, I, I grew up 
duck hunting. And I was the worst because I flock shoot, right? My grandpa would say, stop shooting your shot at all the birds, pick one bird, right? <laughs> EDI is the opposite of my grandpa's approach. Don't pick one bird and target, pick them all. We got to figure out a way to make the campus a safe place. Part of that is through faculty. Faculty are really the, the tip of the spear when it comes to EDI and feeling comfortable in being able to implement. But it's also having someone who, who guides those initiatives. I do think when you have someone in equity, diversity, and inclusion as a sub part of their job, most often the other parts of the job take over. Budget, staffing, other things. HR can be a part of it, but it really has to be a, a, a really a value we buy into together. Please share examples of experience you have in resource development, fundraising, and grants, and why you feel your experience can help to advance the mission of North Idaho College. You know, it's in, not embarrassing, but it's, uh, uh, I'm in the room with someone who's really good at raising money <laughs> and bringing things into a, a college. I'm okay at it. And, and as a president, your job is to leverage relationships for the benefit. I'm really good at friend raising and relationship raising and trust within the institution. Um, but I've become, because of my work at Utah State, Colorado Mountain College and other institutions, good at knowing what to ask for, what, finding out what people are passionate about. Asking for money is less important than asking what they want to support. Finding out what they're interested in giving uh, is really part of the key. I also, um, so, so currently I give out and, and I, I, I've looked at the scholarships given from North Idaho College. It's actually quite impressive for the size of the institution. And again, I, I laugh because I often go to other colleges and talk about my university for our Eastern part of the Utah. I give out a lot of money until I came here and saw you guys give out more per student than I give out. It's, it's not just scholarship, it's program. And, and so one of the things that bringing in funding requires is informal accountability. And a good example, I, I live in an oil and gas extraction area, the Uinta Basin, and, and we chose to live there. We could have lived a lot of places, but we chose to live there. Um, they're big donors for my air quality research. We get funded by the EPA, the Department of Air Quality, at, at the tune of about $2 million a year for air quality research. We could take the money and actually give the formal reports. But I go to the chamber, I go to the Rotary Club, I go to the Duchesne County Business Development Group, and I tell them what we're doing with that research money. So instead of just the formal report going back to the funders, I'm messaging what we're doing and not what the college or the university is doing, but as a partnership, what we're doing. And that's really part of building that relationship. One example that really comes to mind is that my nursing program in Eastern Utah needed more nurse graduates. We just didn't have enough in the hospitals. And the hospitals were asking for nurse graduates but the state wouldn't fund more faculty. And so I went to the hospitals and asked them for the money for faculty for three years until I could get the state to pick it up. That's not the part of the story I wanna focus on. The part of the story I wanna focus on is if I didn't serve on boards with the CEOs of my two hospitals in that region and serve shoulder to shoulder doing other things, they would have never listened to that request. I would have come in and asked for money without already having showed them that I care about the community. So. Fundraising and development is done by professionals, but it's the president's job to message what we're doing with those with that, that money or resources, but to be in a position to begin with where people trust and respect what, what's being given to the community. Please share your experiences with student involvement and how you champion different student engagement activities and initiatives. When I uh, got to Utah State, I found out my student association, USUSA is what we titled, they always have an acronym. I assume it's uh, ASNIC or something here. Um, is, is it, do they use it as a word? ASNIC, uh -huh, thanks. So ASNIC is, uh, I found out they weren't sitting on my, my Monday, I have a Monday meeting, administrative meeting, and they weren't sitting in my meeting. So I had an, I had an administrator who met with them, um, but I wanted them in my, on my, at my table. And there are certain things we talk about that I can't have not only the students there, but not everyone at that table can sit at that table. But for the most part, having that influence, and you'd, you'd be surprised how we used to talk about events we were going to do on the campus and how that's evolved over the years. Instead of us telling them what we want to do for them, 
they're now telling us what we need to do for them. And that, that's an idea of getting students involved in engagement. Um, you know, I mentioned the James Taylor thing at the beginning of this, how none of you mentioned James Taylor. My students don't even know who James Taylor is. And I'm using that as an example of me telling them what events they should have is like me saying, let's go to a James Taylor concert when they wanna go to, and I can't give a, an alternative <laughs> 40 years later, uh, my kids could. But, but so having that perspective, in fact, I'll even, I'm gonna come back to students, faculty are so much younger than I am now. Telling faculty what they want from my perspective, I might think, hey, I'm a cool faculty member too, but the truth is I'm not. So having faculty representation at the table is the same kind of thing. Um, so back to the students, having them involved at the executive level or the elected officials from uh, ASNIC here, USUSA where I am, that's really key. More importantly is walking around the campus. And just like I said, being informally at the Parker Center, the Workforce Training Center, not only walking across campus, but not moving quickly across campus, but sitting down places. You don't have to have a sign that says I'm available. That sounds like a, a dating app, you know, but having something that says being vi visibly available to talk to students. And if they won't talk to you, talking to them. Although I don't know what it is about students now. Um, I, I, I'm always amazed how I, I, I walk up to students and they almost run away. So I, I do worry about my approach currently. I think that's pandemic related. I'll go with that. Because um, I, I want to find out from them what's going on. The way to do that is to also let them know who you are, um, being available and not in the Dr. Taylor way, but in the James way, uh, you know, and being me. I also have to say my, my wife is a, a worker at Utah State University, or not a worker, staff, professional staff member, uh, a therapist. That, that softens me a little bit when we walk across campus. Turns out my young children are really what softened us. So I have two older children, two young children. One of my two young children go onto a campus with me and we go to an event. We do a, Aggie ice cream is big for Utah State. We, we make ice cream, have for 140 years. I don't actually like ice cream, which is kind of one of the dark secrets in my current job. So I pretend to eat ice cream. But when we, we go out to neighborhoods and we hand it out, uh, we just knock on doors and give ice cream to people in all these communities. And we tell them, thanks for being a supporter of Utah State University. It's become a thing where on Facebook, people tell us, come to my neighborhood. But when I have my kids there, that's when people talk to me. That's when I'm more human and more approachable. And, and I think back to uh, ASNIC or USUSA, when I stand with a student and walk across campus, I become more approachable too. That's when other students will come up and talk. So. I, I think higher ed does an okay job listening to students. I think we do a poor job of really meaning it. I, I remember meeting with my, I have a nursing program that's housed in a technical college next door and they wanted to move into my building. So we had a listening session and we spent 40 minutes um, in this listening session, but I could tell I wasn't getting the real answers. I mean, they were, they were just sitting. I, I'd ask questions and they'd give answers back. Uh, and so like a faculty member, I just made them all stand up and we walked outside and sat in a garden area. I said, okay, I'm gonna ask them all the same questions again. And all the answers kind of emerged. So I think sometimes you just gotta change the way we do things to get students to start trusting us. And I think it also means over and over, not once a year. So mm -hmm. thanks. All right, that concludes our eight official questions. So we'll turn it over to you for any closing remarks you'd yeah. like to make. First of all, I, I was thinking earlier today, um, so I see some of you who are here this morning. I know as a college community, and, and this isn't to make you feel good, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm impressed by your sustaining stamina to come to all these events for five candidates. So it's just, let me say, I mean, Ken drove me around the campus this morning. I met with lunch with the executive team. I'm probably gonna do that five times. You know, I like lunch, but I don't like lunch five times with the same similar conversations. So. <laughs> I guess my, and you'll, the community coming to these events, it, it shows a real commitment on your part to finding the right person to lead the institution. That, that says a lot. I also have to say, I've watched, I, I told the group at lunch, I've watched the last year's board meetings, not for the reasons you might think. How I learn, I've, I've done a fair amount of consulting. Why I watch is to figure out the culture of a place. I have yet to see another college or university where there's more attendance at board meetings. Now, there may be reasons why, but it's one of those things that shows passion. 
I'm, I'm impressed by the community engagement here today, faculty engagement, um, and the willingness to do that over and over again to find the right president. I also was thinking, last night my wife and I left our hotel and we ran along the river and then along the lake, um, and, and beautiful as you can imagine. In fact, not that we're fast, um, but we were much slower last night because there's so much to look at, pictures to send and people that, hey, look at this, you know, it, it's an amazing place. Um, but I, I, I am impressed by what motivates this college's workforce and community support is the, the words that uh, Sarah gave at lunch was a magical place. You know, I think back, to, I grew up in the kind of Disneyland era of what made Disneyland special. You know, the cleanliness, the commitment, the staff. You have that kind of magic, happy place here, despite challenges. It, it, it's not gone. Um, I do think based on our conversation at lunch, I think one of the things that's now coalescing uh, in my mind, whether I'm the right presidential candidate or not, I'm excited for North Idaho just to take a step and just to take some direction. Um, you know, I, I remember once arguing with my two younger kids about where to go to dinner one night and I, I did all the dad things, you know, my dad never asked me where we were going to go to dinner. He just took me to dinner. And I'm asking you and you're fighting with me about it. You know, that, that kind of thing. It, and I remember at that moment saying, just get in the car. We're going to dinner. You know, the college may just need to get in the car and go to dinner, start moving forward. And, and I'm excited because I think there's so much here to be leveraged uh, for the future. I do believe that higher education. So, so whether I stay at Utah State or whether I come to North Idaho College or end up somewhere else, which I doubt because I'm not applying anywhere else because I really like Utah State. The next 10 years, which is really kind of my time frame, 10 to 15 for my career, uh, it's going to be a more dynamic time than the last 10 years. And student needs are going to change. Instructional needs are going to change. Um, one of the reasons why I like being here is North Idaho is more nimble uh, than a university. Universities are, are fairly constrained by lots of lots of things, uh, bureaucracy. I'm excited to come to a place like this where we can move together and as a team. So thanks for letting me be here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We appreciate hearing and learning from your experience. Just a reminder for our audience, there's the online feedback form if you go to the presidential search on our website and our board of trustees will receive that feedback from the poly group and look through it. So if you have an opportunity, please complete it. And that concludes our forum for today.